my cousins and I are joint owners of my grandfather's farm. And it's, he worked so hard to, to buy the farm. His parents were slaves and he was a blacksmith and that's how he earned his money and taught himself to read as well as a, a minister. And we said, we would keep the, the farm in the family. So yes, we've gone back. exciting um, episode for you today and um, San Ramon's former mayor Abram Wilson is joining us. Welcome Abram. Thank you Rapan. It's always a pleasure. How Thank are you, you doing with the new shelter in place in order now where some businesses are open and some aren't? Are you confused or are you thoroughly confused? Thoroughly confused but um, just dealing with it like a lot of residents um, you, when you don't have a choice you deal with life. Correct. And so let me ask you one question. Last week, um, I had two uh, people come on for the personal grooming series. One was for hair care and one was for skin care during COVID-19. Uh, would it be safe to assume that you are not feeling particularly challenged in any of those? Uh, well, obviously from the hair care, <laughs> No, <laughs> not at all. I haven't been challenged by that for quite some time. But <laughs> I had to confirm because I have to make sure everybody's feeling they have all the answers. It's a crisis for several of us. We don't have access to salons and spas. So I just wanted to make sure. So you how know, about the skin? You said hair, no, but skin? But no, but um, club sport, I'm usually um, there at club sport and exercising and things like that. So that has affected me to be able to, um, to find other ways to exercise and to um, maintain um, my mobility like a lot of people. Well, I'm glad you're here joining us. Um, I'm a partner, I'm at the ready, encouraging anybody who has not responded to the census please do that quickly. Uh, it takes 10 minutes of your time. The census takers cannot go door to door anytime soon. So please respond to the census as soon as you can. Uh, thank you. Ibran, do you have anything to add to that census message? Well, a lot of residents do know, but not clearly understand the importance of the census. When you understand the importance of the census. You realize that a lot of our federal dollars, whether it's for education, transportation, those basic needs that a city has or a county has is based on your census. And if you don't um, let them know the population, the demographics and the needs, then when our elected officials are going to DC to try and get funds, they're put at the back of the line. And I think the census is so important now because everyone, because of lack of sales tax, less of property tax, everyone is going to be in DC looking for the federal money. And they're going to get dole out those funds depending on the census and how the population and the need. So to me, that's so important. Well, thank you. I appreciate you mentioning that. So people, please pay attention. Listen to our former mayor. It really will make a difference if you do fill out and if you don't fill out, we do need a full count for our city. Um, thank you for that, Abram. So let's start with your life and go back. Well, before that, you have had a full plate, a rather overflowing plate uh, at every stage of your life, college, um, the United States Army, your, your career as an investment banker in San Ramon on the Arts Council, Parks Commission, City Council, and then our first elected mayor. Did you ever, in all those years that you were running around, think that you would ever do a Zoom interview with me sitting in your room <laughs> wondering <laughs> what's going on <laughs> in the outside world? <laughs> No, um, not, not in my wildest imagination. Um, 
this is the first time I've done Zoom to begin <laughs> with. And I had to call my family saying, okay, I'm doing this Zoom. How do I hook up? How do I get um, the connection? So it was relatively easy. So all those who have not uh, participated in Zoom, please, it, if I can do it, you can do it. Well, I'm glad you did. That's why we're able to do this today. And so let's go back to the very beginning, to your really, to the past um, and your connection with Henry IV, uh, who was uh, the first king of England who actually switched over from French to English being the mother tongue. What is your connection with that? Well, I, when I, um, the... Mormon community um, did a um, ancestry check and realized the fact that we were related to Henry the Fourth, France, and um, it was interesting to say the least. And evidently, um, my ancestors left France after doing the French Revolution, fled to Amsterdam, and because they were merchants. And from Amsterdam, they went to Jamaica and as I like to say, picked up a little color because they married a free Jamaican. And then they went from there because they were merchants to New York and Charleston, South Carolina. So there were um, that connection and we realized how um, we're all connected in a certain way. So, so that was very enlightening and a lot of that was gained, knowledge was gained by the census. Um, going back in the history of Charleston, um, the census showed who was living with whom and how many people were in the home and those things. So that helped them be able to track my ancestry through the census. So because of this ancestry, do you have an, a slight English accent or a French accent that comes out? Do you even speak a French? You know, it's, it's very interesting that I don't speak French, but a lot of my um, cousins actually lived in France and did um, taught in France. And it was always a certain part of our family that making that connection. So yes, it's there, but we also um, realized that we have connection to Scotland and um, and realize that I was 1% Polynesian. So I have no idea how that oh. can. So, <laughs> so. am, am, am I um, uh, safe to assume then you visited all these places and um, at least taken in some of your ancestry through a tourist visit of-, I have of not museums. yet. I have not been, I've been to England and of course uh, around the world, but now I hope to go back to France with and visit some relatives and say, you know, guess who's coming to dinner <laughs> and, and having a one-on-one -on -one with my relatives. Yes, that's a good way of doing it. And hopefully we'll not be uh, sheltered in place soon so you get to travel. So let's go back to Abram as a little boy. Um, you grew up in Charleston. You lived there for eight years. Um, your name, H. Abram Wilson, what does the H stand for? The H stands for Holliston, and Holliston is a, a family name in Charleston, and it is um, those that were educated um, African Americans, and there is a, you can go online and you can see there, um, Holliston is a community, it was a school, and my mother decided that that would be a nice connection. Also, I'm named Abram, which is after my grandfather, who was Abram Dent. So, so, uh, so if it's it's a lot now, your parents were educators. Um, your great granddad was a physician. Um, a lot of expectations, a lot of discipline uh, in your household. How many times do you recall growing up where you called H. Abram Wilson, "Come here, I need to talk to you" from your parents? No, it was, um, well, my parents called me Abram, but we have one, two, three, four, five first cousins that have Abram in their name. So I was called H. Abram, depending who and um, who was there. But uh, my parents always expected a certain um, behavior from us, an understanding of how important education was and 
basically you are responsible for your own actions and interact. Right. So the, you, you mean to tell me you were not really in big trouble compared to the rest of the family members? They never had to address you by a full name to ground you, um, but it was easier to just call you by, call you Abram and just have you pay attention. To well, what I knew if, if my mother used my entire name, I needed to run because that was what I was getting at. Oh, yes. you, you knew you were in trouble. Yes, <laughs> yes, definitely. Okay. And so that happened a little bit. Okay, tell me about your life in um, growing up in Charleston. There were obviously some incidents that are public knowledge, but there are some that aren't. And we want to hear, uh, you mentioned Percy Street in your conversation and you mentioned about your aunt. Uh, who happened to be a very good, well-known seamstress. So could you enlighten us on that? Well, I, we lived at 27 Percy Street. My aunt and I had relatives on Percy Street. And Percy Street um, looked exactly like um, Victorian homes in San Francisco. In fact, the 27 Percy Street is on the historical guide in Charleston when um, so uh, a lot of the just like in, in California in San Francisco you aren't able to um, renovate or um, do anything to the home that would take away from its historical value so we had two or three um, homes and relatives living on Percy Street. What would be your fondest memory there do you recall or even one or two the, f the best ones living there? I think um, family more than anything else. And we grew up, I grew up in a very segregated um, time in, um, in Charleston where the signs were um, colored only or white only. So it was very interesting when I look back how we maneuvered around the, those um, situations. But again, it to me, it made us stronger more than anything else. One thing about this, that since um, African-Americans were only allowed to live in certain places, um, we weren't, um, we were segregated, but next to me was the doctor, was everyone that was um, here in um, living in our home. And that, to me, that was the most important thing that everyone was in the same community. So everyone had a frame of reference of what was expected of you. So we just want to make sure that everybody understands who will be watching this video. It's not a noise that's coming out of nowhere. It's a public safety alert that just went on. And I think Abram, your phone is on just like mine was. So it just <laughs> amplified the sound a little bit. So it wasn't anything um, that we did or, or technology did, but thank you. That was, so talking about segregation and obviously racism was a huge part um, talking about race relations and uh, what was going on. There is one famous story that has been uh, publicized is about the red um, toy sports car um, incident with your dad, if you want to elaborate on that. Uh, but my question to you is, did you ever end up buying a red toy, uh, a red sports car? <laughs> Obviously not a toy, or are there plans to buy one? What a part of you're talking about is I was I guess about four or five and we went to a department store with my father and my brother was there also. And I had saved up some money um, from birthday and dad was contributing to it and we could purchase anything we want. And I saw this red car that I said, wow, I really wanted that. And, and um, dad said, fine, he would contribute um, to it. We always had to earn money. We would never, um, dad would never pay for it. We would have to always have some money to add to whatever we were getting if it was something personal. So we uh, picked up the car and I was very happy that I was getting it and we stood in line and it seemed like five or 10 minutes. And every time the salesperson would take the person in front of us who happened to be white and we were the only people of color in the store. 
And it was like five or six minutes and no one would wait on it. They would always wait on the white person. And finally, um, I said, what's going on? We're nuts. And dad just said, no, we're not going to shop here. And he put the car back. And, and I said, what's going on? And he said, we're leaving now. So in the car, dad explained to me what was going on to my brother and me. And, and I said, that's not fair. They weren't waiting on us because we were, we were black and colored then. And he said, life isn't fair. Get over it. And that was my, um, and so we lived in this interesting sort of world of um, having a housekeeper, having a cook, but still being in that um, not treated as equals. So did you buy the car or not, the red car, after this incident? No. We Much never, later in life. Never, never did. I, I think later on in life, I already said I'd buy a, a red Maserati, but I haven't. Um, you haven't looked at it actively. Well, you probably and then, will. <laughs> and then the other thing was, in later on in life, when you look at it, it was a, buying a red car meant that when you were driving down the street, that police would see you speeding. So I never, that came into my mind, say, if I buy a car and it's red, that, um, you know, um, police would automatically search and look you, um, give you that second look. And it was bad enough, anyhow, you know, driving a a nice car and being stopped by police regardless of what you were doing. So I didn't need to add that. So Well, I have heard about red and yellow sports cars are stopped and ticketed way more than the safe white or black or blue cars. So yeah. I think you saved yourself a whole bunch of um, um, traffic stops probably <laughs> that were not. Yes. <laughs> so let's get back to your life. Um, and when you moved away, you moved at age eight or after age eight to Philadelphia. How was it over there? Was, was it similar to Charleston? Was it worse? Was it better? Did you feel more at home? How was it? I, I found Philadelphia and you would think of Philadelphia um, as being um, in moving from the South, um, not racist, but yes, it was. Um, when we first moved to Philadelphia, we lived in predominantly um, African-American um, in North Philadelphia. Then my parents moved to West Philadelphia on, and the first couple of um, weeks, my parents stayed at our new home in West Philadelphia. We stayed with my aunt and uncle in North Philadelphia because we, they had the um, uh, things painted on their house to get out. And so they did not want us to be in that environment, not knowing what was going to happen. So I found that the same, it was more of a blatant racism in, in Philadelphia than, and, um, versus the subtle races, racism in um, Charleston. So there's always been that element there. So before we move on to the next segment of your life, have you um, gone back to Philadelphia and Charleston anytime um, in the recent past? And if so, have you noticed any difference there? Well, I am very, very fortunate that we still, my grandfather owned a farm right outside of um, Charleston in Walterboro, South Carolina. And my cousins and I are joint owners of my grandfather's farm. And it's, he worked so hard to, to buy the farm. His parents were slaves and he was a blacksmith. And that's how he earned his money and taught himself to read as well as a, a minister. And we said, we would keep the, the farm in the family. So yes, we've gone back. Philadelphia, I go back uh, periodically. Unfortunately, I was there um, beginning of the this year for a funeral for a family member and went past the, the house. But it was really interesting because in Philadelphia, my family moved into an Italian um, Jewish um, neighborhood. So it was very, very interesting. Um, and I chose my friends. Um, by whether or not their parents could cook or not. So um, my mother wasn't exactly the best cook in the world since 
um, Cabby did all the cooking. So when we went to Philadelphia, I had to um, to find someone to get to, uh, to be fed. Um, so that was what, interesting. What was your favorite meal or food? Um, was you said you selected your friends where you could get food. Ralph what, was, was there a menu that you were looking at particularly that this is, I like this, or this will be my friend? Is that what you were looking for? So what Ralph was your yeah, Ralph Curcio's um, grandmother, they were Italian. And I, I love Italian food because of that. I would go into the Curcio's home and I could smell because they always had a pot on uh, of something. And it was just, um, I developed a, a love for Italian food because of that. Thank how you. About, how about French, French food or um, any of the British foods? They are big on puddings. British puddings. Did you have friends who, uh, you're giving me ideas. Maybe I should start looking at friends who. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I learned because of that. And so my mother um, was never, because we had, um, uh, she was one of the youngest um, children, siblings, and there were 12, 13 of them. So she never really did anything. So obviously she did not know how to cook or anything. Then she married my father and had um, Candy took care of us. So I learned how to cook because of, of survival skills. Um, you know, my mother was a horrible cook until we left home. And then all of a sudden she had these, this epiphany and learned how to cook. So my daughter would say, Oh, Nana really knows how to cook. And I said, well, who are you talking about? You know, not my mother. But um, I learned how to cook because uh, my mother did not. My father cooked also. So that is, was it. Is that your mother's picture behind you? <laughs> You're speaking about her. I just want to make sure. <laughs> yes, it is. Yeah, yes. Yes. We want to pay tribute to your mother, Triga. So what is the one uh, dish that you take pride in cooking? So you said you had to learn to survive. What was the one thing that you learned initially and that one dish that you're very proud of? I, I love um, veal, um, a nice veal chop or fresh vegetables. Or, and I do the, of course, um, during the holidays, black-eyed peas and rice and greens and sweet potatoes, candied yams, um, all of those things that, and macaroni and cheese. So that's the standard that, and I bake my own bread and I love to bake and things like that, so. Oh, wow, you, you have great culinary skills. That's um, something to aim for. For me, I don't bake, so I, it's, it's good that I should learn, have something. So let's go to your college years. You attended um, Central Ohio State. Yes. And uh, college, with college comes, of course, academic pressures, but there's also dating pressures. And you talked about your brother. Where is your brother in all this? And, and you said girls used to come and talk to you, but you found out it was not to talk to you. Can you tell us a little bit about your brother and about your life in college and dating? My my brother um, and I are close now. We talk at least once or twice a week. But growing up, um, my father, I look like my mother's side of the family. My brother looked like my father's side of the family. Um, Robert, um, comparing the two, Robert always had, um, Robert has, um, sort of sandy curly hair with blue green eyes. Uh, he looked like he wasn't even related to me. So when um, I would have all these girls, as soon as they found out that I was related to my brother, they would be my best friends so they could get to, to say hello to my brother. So that was, that was somewhat positive, but it was, it was somewhat negative. And when I would visit, uh, my brother would visit me at school, at college, they would say, um, oh, that's your fraternity brother. No, that's my real brother. We went through um high school and we we're two years in high school together and no one realized that was my brother because it, wilson is such a common name and um, it was always quite a surprise when um people would come to the house and see robert and i together but once they saw my father and mother they would realize um we lost you all right music has always been a part of my life and it was the fact that my brother 
would um, come to visit me, as I said. Um, but in college, I decided what school I wanted to go to because of music. Um, Leontine Price was an opera singer, and she went there. And my parents wanted me to go to school in Philadelphia, either go to the Temple or University of Pennsylvania. And I decided I wanted to go to Central State uh, because Leontine Price went there and because it was a a um, historical black university and growing up in a totally um, white environment, um, I wanted to have that experience more than anything else. So that was interesting to go to predominantly black school, not having a lot of um, teachers that were African-American. Majority of my teachers were all white. Um, it was an enlightening experience and I enjoyed it immensely. I was pre-med at that time um, because of the pressure of my parents, but um, their music department was outstanding. I was very, very fortunate that I took an act, um, active role in student government. I um, was always the representative and I was senior class president. And so that was interesting. It, it helped me to grow and find my own identity going to a school. Like and it, it, it was something you mentioned in a comment a, a long time back. You said music makes us civilized. Why did you feel it was music um, and not any other form of art that would uh, make someone be more civilized? Do you feel it's, it's the, the way of expressing things um, through either through instruments or, or singing that, that people connect to more? What was your reasoning behind that? statement. Even growing up in Philadelphia and throughout, um, I was went to um, the Settlement House in Philadelphia, which is um, a music school. And um, I did a lot of um, super work, it's called, in, um, in opera. And it was very, very interesting because there weren't a lot of African Americans singing opera. So you were talking about music Music joins us all together. And the most important thing I found that um, singing opera and classical music, it opened up a completely different world to me. And regardless, I will tell people that I like um, Mozart to Motown and, and realize that the people that I had almost nothing in common with loved music. So you were able to see people one-on-one -on -one and they saw you as individual when you were in that genre. So, and singing in choruses, um, that joined everyone together. So my next, you know what my next request is going to be. I know you even <clears throat> later in life, you received an award for supporting music education in schools. So obviously music has been a big part of your life. Would you please, um, just a little bit. You know, when I, I think of music um, and what we're going through now as far as um, honoring first responders, whether it's the farmers or the um, people who transfer the food and other goods to the stores, to the, um, the people who um, check us out at the, um, at a grocery stores, at the police, fire, everyone who allows us to be, quote, safe in this. There is a, a song that uh, I think it's having grace. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me, I once was lost, but now I have found, was blind, but now I see. That's it right now. Thank you so much. Thank you. I appreciate that. I'm going to ask you one question. You were, you were big a big supporter of uh, music um, education in schools. Do you, 
Do you see this trend of not having enough funds for music in our schools um, at this time as a problem? Or do you see this is something that's fixable um, as we move ahead uh, if parents take on a bigger share of their, the, the problem on them? I guess it's not a parent's responsibility, but funding has been a huge issue. So how do you feel about that? Well, funding is, my parents, my mother, we always said, and father has said, you can always tell a good school um, whether or not, because back to school night, when they see the, um, if the parking lot is full, you know, parents who care. And that's why we moved down to San Ramon. When you look at the San Ramon Unified School District, um, we have um, a lot of the things that we have now because parents care. It, there was an old... Um, saying that when you come to back to school night, don't forget your checkbook because you know, the supporting the, um, the extracurricular activities. And I think whether it's the, the sports, whether it's the arts, all those are so important. And I equate the two that when you see athletes before they go and whatever they, whether their sport is, they put on the headphones and they listen to music regardless of what. So that's important. Um, and again, just touching how music makes us all civilized. You can go to a, a country um, concert and enjoy it. You can go to a, an, a classical or you can go to pop. Everyone loves jazz. There's that, that sort of unique, um, I think, cord that binds us, a thread that binds us all together in the arts, whether it's the visual arts, whether it's um, performing arts, all of those. And I think it's, it allows us to understand who we are as individuals. Now, you were a part of the Army Medical Corps. Um, yes. How, how was that experience for you? Um, again, race would have been uh, an issue um, at some point. So please describe to us your overall uh, experience and uh, any memories from those years? I had, um, I was in California then in San Francisco when I was drafted, but I wanted to say goodbye to my parents. So I said, well, you know, I'll figure this out. I will um, go to Philadelphia and um, be drafted on the East Coast. I was inducted, um, was, I was one of the last people drafted in the United States, which was interesting. Um, I went to, from San Francisco to Philadelphia to be drafted because my parents were in Philadelphia and um, went to Fort Bragg, North Carolina. When we arrived at Fort Bragg, North Carolina, we took the train from Philadelphia to North Carolina. And going into Fort Bragg, North Carolina, there was a huge sign that said, welcome to Klan country. And I went, whoa, what's going on? And we ended up getting into the base. It was a farmer and the sign was on his property so he could do that. So we get to the base and we're filling out the form. And so the sergeant said, oh, you are a member, you are um, from San Francisco are you a member of the Black Panther Party? And he was being sarcastic. And I said to him, well, are you a member of the Klan? And I don't think he responded to my, um, my, my remark kindly. Um, because of that, I was on, um, confined to my barracks for almost two weeks while they did a background check on me to make sure that I was um, not a member of the Black Panther Party, which I wasn't. Um, so that was my introduction to the armed forces when um, first, my first day in, in Fort Bragg, North Carolina. Did you feel it was a bit humiliating and were, or were you getting used to the fact that um, color does factor in wherever you are making an appearance? The, I had a family that understood that, um, that prepared for me. Um, as I stated earlier, my parents always says, life's not fair, get over it. And another thing they always told me, never let anyone pack your bags. And that getting into your head, determining how you will respond to life. 
And so I didn't think anything of it. I said, well, that's their problem. I get a chance to relax in the barracks alone. Um, it didn't bother me at all. Um, so how, how long did you serve and um, how was the overall experience? If you were to look back now and um, look at certain things that unfolded, would you say it was overall a positive experience? I know you're a very proud vet, but it, what overall do you feel some things could have been different for you? No, not really. And I, I think it was another experience. Um, I remember um, I was in the shower and I noticed these guys watching. And they were, I said I was a little nervous to say the least. And so um, got to know them a little bit and they were from the um, mountains in North Carolina. And they had never been socially around a, a, a black man before, an African-American. And they were looking to see where my tail was. And they were very surprised that I was an African-American and I didn't have a tail because they were always taught. So, uh, and they became one of my really good friends and we talked about life. So again, understanding because of someone's ignorance their prejudice and once you get to know them and they get to know you so to me that was um something positive do you feel that ignorance is still prevalent in the world oh, it is it is <laughs> but i think once people get to know you as a person um you know they either like you or not but um there is going to be prejudice on, on sometimes on both sides the way sometimes because of the way people treat you and the way you treat people and my parents and always said to me you know and it stated to me I don't think that I am better than anyone else unless they think they're better than me then we have a problem Correct. so once you finish your um, uh, you were honorably discharged and I was in the medical corps but coming, coming back to San Francisco, it was during that time that I remember going on the Presidio and wearing my uniform. And the main thing they told us, don't go off the Presidio with your uniform on because that was during the Vietnam War and the protesters would um, um, sp um, spit on you and call you names because you're wearing a uniform. So again, you know, it's like, okay, I'm gonna wear my uniform off of work, off of the base just to aggravate people, but not just to aggravate, but just to show that I'm a proud and um, American and soldier. Did, did you encounter anything for being a, a little rebellious? No, I, I, no one ever approached me. I, I guess they thought that anyone that wore the uniform off the base that maybe, um, was a little psychic and they started to leave them alone. So I never had that problem at all. So after that, you start your job, um, correct? As, as, and your role starts very actively as, as an investment banker. Um, I mean, th that's a very impressive um, resume in itself. Uh, not that the previous part of your life wasn't, but this takes you into a whole different direction. It did not match what you were doing in college initially. What made you decide to change course and how was that experience um, uh, in, that, in your career? I had I'd come back to, um, to San Francisco. I was working as a medical technologist because I ran the lab when I was in the army at Mount, um, and I was actually at Stanford and I um, was taking, um, decided I wanted to go into psychology. A friend of mine came to me and said, um, Wells Fargo uh, was looking and they were getting a lot of pressure because they had, um, there was their, um, the investment floor where there was like a hundred um, people on their, um, investment floor and there were no no one of color and so they wanted to interview people that could possibly be traders and to be able to integrate um, Wells Fargo trading floor and I had no interest but a friend of mine a mutual friend came to me and said would you mind um, just 
um, interviewing for it. And I said, yeah, I know nothing about business, but I'll, yeah, I'll introduce. Um, fast forward, somehow I ended up getting the job. So walking on um, Wells Fargo trading floor, it was very interesting because I was the sacrificial lamb to, to, um, to walk on the trading floor. And at that time, there was nothing called being um, uh, correct about anything. So it was very interesting. Yes, growing up um, in Charleston and seeing the signs coming to Philadelphia and um, my parents when they moved into the neighborhood. And I think a lot of things prepared me for this role at Wells Fargo. Um, walking on the trading floor, there was like 50 or 60 traders and sales and personnel and um, being, I call the sacrificial lamb, walking in on the trading floor and being the first person of color to be on the trading floor at Wells Fargo Bank was interesting. But again, just dealing with life and um, it worked out. I managed to um, be nervous, but not showing it going home and saying, what am I got myself into showing up the next day and saying that I'm going to deal with this, I'm going to be successful. Well, I was like, what have I gotten myself into? Because um, people were not politically correct. There were racial slurs, there were jokes, there were, it was like um, nothing was sacred. But again, it didn't bother me. It was um, knowing that people, um, once, I always felt that once they get to know you, either they would like you or not, but I had more confidence in myself and the fact that being in a lot of um, situation that I was the only person of color was no big deal with me at all. Well, you, you climbed up that career ladder um, and, and did really well for yourself. Um, what would you say was the most challenging um, part of that journey? Was it um, you getting into new environments and having to deal with new things related to race or related to what you were learning? Or was it people, groups of people challenging your authority, um, not accepting that essentially a person of color can be leading and uh, being involved? Now, the good thing about the trading floor is you were trading billions of dollars a day, but a lot of it were people from all over the world and all of the United States. So no one ever saw your face. I traded with people for years that um, never met me. And when they would finally meet me because I did not have distinctive accent, would say, oh, wow you're actually, you're black. And it was getting to know people over the phone. And when you talk to people every single day and under pressure, you get to know them. I've gone through, um, you know, marriages, divorces, birth of their children, and race never came up. It was like, oh, you're Abram. So a lot of people later on said, we thought you were Jewish. Um, and it was interesting when they would finally meet me. And it was like, oh, you're different. And I'd say, no, I'm not different. There are a lot of people, um, my race that are just like me. And that, that's a, a conversation we had uh, several times about people not really knowing who you were till they met you and then saw who you were in person. And, and the impression never changed. It was just like, oh, so you're, you're an African-American male. But moving on to your move to San Ramon, why San Ramon? And uh, what were your first impressions and why did you feel this was the place for you? Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me i once was lost but now i have found was blind but now i see 